Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Hello, hello. Today's episode was such a treat to record. My guest today, Bren Halley, is full of wisdom. She shares so many tips on how to be an effective communicator that speaks authentically and in alignment to themselves. Brent Halley is a communication coach, educator, and secret weapon to thousands of big-hearted go-getters around the world. Her greatest passion and the why behind everything she does is to empower people to show up and speak up as the versions of themselves they most want to be. She provides teams and individuals with the practical tools and coaching they need to overcome nerves, express themselves clearly, and exude authentic confidence in all of their interactions. Brent founded Self Spoken with a mission to share the most valuable and practical skills she gained from both her acting career, which began with the national tour of a Broadway musical, and the near decade she spent facilitating communication and leadership trainings in the U.S. and abroad. Nothing lights Brent up more than empowering people from every background, industry, and career stage to stop trying to quote-unquote prove themselves when they speak and to start communicating with real, undeniable confidence from the inside out. Outside of work, Brent enjoys fewer things more than long, delicious meals with friends, traveling with her husband Eli, and dancing full out in her living room. In today's episode, Brent shares on why we feel nervous when we're put on the spot and how to overcome that, on being self-spoken, finding your voice and honing it, the importance of intentionality and how to establish that, what gentle authority is and how she incentivizes her clients to apply it, how to change your relationship to nerves, and so many awesome tips on how to become a more confident communicator. Come get comfy and tag along for the ride. Hi, Bren. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Jess. Thanks for having me. I'm so inspired by your energy and what you do. You help people tune into their inner voice and own it. You're an entrepreneur, communications coach, and I love your company's tagline, quit being soft-spoken, don't settle for well-spoken, and become self-spoken. Can you share a little bit about who you are and what does me being self-spoken mean? Yeah, sure. So my name is Bren Howley. Like you said, I am the founder and CEO of Self-Spoken, which is a communication coaching company. More than anything, I really help big-hearted go-getters find that sweet spot between being able to come across how they want to express themselves clearly, confidently, and still that trust in the people that they're speaking to or working with while staying true to who they are. In so many cases in my life and in my own training and in my own experience, there's been this pressure on people to speak in a certain way or come across in a certain way in order to be considered X, right? In order to be considered a leader or an expert or an authority on a subject or confident or a million other adjectives that we could put in there. And I've noticed really over the past decade how that pressure really turns into people just slowly abandoning themselves. And it can be in situations that are just casual conversations like checking in with their boss or checking in with a colleague or speaking up in a meeting. And in that moment, that pressure to prove kind of sneaks in there. And so some other version of themselves comes online. 
And so what being self-spoken really means to me is finding that balance, that sweet spot, that integrity, where you can really bring who you are, leverage who you are in those moments, instead of trying to prove or hustle for approval or project something that doesn't feel true to you. So that's really what that means to me. Mm, that was so profound when you said the pressure leads us to abandon ourselves. Yeah, big time. <laughs> and it's so funny because a lot of people, me included, I thought it was because I wasn't confident enough or that, ooh, I'm not eloquent. I'm yes. So I thought it was all these things that were quote unquote wrong with me. Mm. But it's because it wasn't me who was speaking. Yeah, that so beautifully said. You know, the, the word confidence comes from the Latin con and fide, con fidelity, with fidelity, with loyalty. And so when we talk about confidence, we really talk about communicating confidently, which is what I teach with all the passion that I have in the world. We're talking about speaking in a way that's loyal to who you are. That is what self-spoken means to me. It's that you can communicate in a way that's trusting that the instincts that you're having, the values that you're bringing to that conversation, the intention that you know you have going in is enough because that's who you are. And staying true to that is what we see on the outside as confidence. I think people really think about it too often the other way around, that if I project this confidence, if I come across as confident, then I'll feel more confident on the inside. When there's absolutely skills and tools I teach for exuding those qualities, really embodying those qualities so other people can see it, but the work has got to start from the inside out for us to really understand what is this pressure on a biological level, what's happening when we're communicating in those situations that causes us to feel nervous or second guessy or whatever it might be. And then from that place, nurturing yourself and your own biology, staying true and in alignment with who you are, then you can exude those adjectives that you're going for so much more easily, naturally. You don't even have to try. So can we talk a little bit about that pressure and nervousness? What happens Physi physiologically, <laughs> I don't know if we can yeah. say, <laughs> yeah, because I know you focus, you focus on like four essentials in your coaching, the physiology, the intentionality, the physicality, and individuality. Why are those words so hard to me right now? <laughs> they are. Do you, want to, do you want to say it again? Sure, look at you giving me space to do it. Physiology, intentionality, physicality, and individuality. Can you dive into each of these deeper? Yeah, absolutely. So just to take physiology, because that's really where we started. When we're on the spot, and it could be, again, a casual, what would, let me back up. <laughs> when we're on the spot, and that could be a otherwise casual conversation where someone might ask you a question that you haven't quite thought through before. That's just a day-to-day -day situation that a lot of my students and clients find themselves in. Or let's say it's a higher stakes kind of presentation situation. Maybe you're a business owner and you're about to give a webinar, right? And you have stakes attached to that thing. So whatever that on the spot moment is for you, there are really two primal fears that are being tickled in that moment. And those two primal fears are the fear of being singled out when eyes are on us. And the second fear is the fear of not belonging, of potentially being kicked out of the tribe, right? The fear of being singled out is our earliest survival instinct. If I were a little creature in the woods, and suddenly there was another pair of eyes on me or several pairs of eyes on me. I'm aware of that. What does this mean for me? Not good news. This means dinner time. Yes. So our limbic brain, the, the part of our brain that's responsible for our fight or flight response 
is getting ready to actually fight that situation or run out of that situation, which is why we feel the nerves induced by adrenaline and cortisol. So that's the singled out piece, but then there's also, also the more socially conditioned fear that's part of the physiology piece, which is the fear of not belonging, right? When we evolved past just those primal moments of potentially being singled out, we learn to exist in tribes. And so that was our new survival mechanism to fit into a group. And so if we're in a situation where we feel like that's in danger, our status of fitting in, then we're physiologically triggered also. And usually in these on the spot moments, both these things are being triggered at the same time. We're both afraid of being singled out, like standing out too much, but we're also afraid of not fitting in and of being left out, right? So all these fears are being triggered, not just in our internal chatter, like in our thoughts, but in our chemistry. So if you feel nervous or you start second guessing or maybe your voice gets shaky or your heart starts racing, whatever it is for you, you are not crazy. You are a human being and your chemistry is actually working. So a lot of what I teach people and where I start with anyone I'm working with, before we get to the messaging piece of things, before we get to the mindset piece of things, before we get into the really tactical communication skills, we have to talk about what's happening in the body so that you can deal with that in the moment and take on some behaviors that are gonna help you feel a whole lot more comfortable and confident on the inside so that you can then start exuding those qualities on the outside. So that's the physiology piece. Do you want me to keep diving? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Please. <laughs> so then the, the physicality piece is really the nonverbal signals that we send when we're communicating. It's all the things that we're saying beyond the words, right? So the quality of eye contact I'm making, how much space I'm taking up, whether or not I'm using my hands, what the inflection of my voice is doing, what my pace is like, whether or not I'm using a lot of us and ums. So there are so many nonverbal signals, but we know from the sociological research that we as human beings perceive communication signals. We take in other people's communication signals before we even process the words that they're using. So when I'm talking to you, and especially when I can see you and I'm blessed with sight, I'm taking in all the signals you're sending and that's what's making me form my impression of you more so than me registering the words that you're using. So a big piece that I walk people through is just gaining the self-awareness around what signals are you sending? Just by matter of habit, what signals do you mean to be sending? And where in the middle is the composite of signals that really represents how you wanna come across? That vision that you hold for yourself, what people really get when they communicate with you. So that's really the big self-awareness building piece. What signals are you sending? What signals do you mean to be sending? And how can we make sure that that's really aligned with how you want to show up in the world? So that's the physicality piece. Intentionality is really the mindset piece. This is really about the energy and the intention that you're bringing to any conversation or presentation or interview, whatever it might be. It's really getting clear on what's that scene that you're walking into. I come from an acting background, so I leverage a lot of acting skills here, which is what's your role in the scene? What's the scene that's about to play out? What in impact or effect do you wanna have on the other person? And therefore, what energy do you need to bring? So it's really the, the mindset piece of it, getting really clear about that. And then the last piece is the individuality piece, which is, really where we dive into the messaging piece of things, how we string all the words together so that we can be clear, succinct, real, true to ourselves. And this is really where I, I coach people to integrate specific frameworks, frameworks that make it easy for people to trust their own individual instincts when they get a question. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> I can go back when they get a specific question and be able to articulate 
just a, a clear message in a way that sounds like them. So the individuality piece is really where we dive into, yeah, how they say what they're saying in terms of the actual words that they're using. Thank you for breaking each step so clearly because I find it so fascinating. Oftentimes the first one, I don't know, probably not the first step, but the first awareness of your physiology is so powerful because we often just feel the nerves, feel the urge to run away, and then let that kind of like fried every rest of whatever comes out, like our body language, it's probably like completely like, I want to shrink. And then like what we want to say, we it's also being filtered by like, oh my gosh, am I saying it better enough? Like, and we just let the nerves take over completely. Yes. Yes. And it's such an internal game. You know, it's interesting. One of the big ahas I feel like people usually have when they start working with me is firstly, how the nerves and the internal chatter manifests on the outside in ways they didn't even realize. But at the same time, how all that internal stuff is also in a lot of ways invisible. We think it's so visible. We think we're like a glass box walking around this world and everyone can see right into us and see every thought and moment of self-doubt that we're experiencing. And they just can't. And there's something that's really empowering about that because it's not to say, pretend like it's not happening, but when you know it's just yours that you're experiencing and you know how to nurture that in you and you know that you're not losing points with people on the outside or they're thinking less of you because they can't see it. So there's something really empowering about coming to terms with just being able to assess your own style and, and really watch what I like to think of as the game tape, right? Rolling back the game tape on how you're actually communicating. Mm, yes, I remember, I think it was one of the uh, your posts or blog posts where you shared about how pauses are not as long for the listener or viewer as it is for you. And when I first started guiding yoga or just talking, I thought a millisecond was like, oh my God, I need to keep fill up the room. I need to keep talking. And then it's like, actually it's a pause. It's okay when I'm comfortable with it, when I learn to be comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting that that comes up in yoga too. How, how would that, how would you try and fill the silences there? Before it would be like, uh, just check in how you're doing, like giving more cues, like tune into your body, your breath. But sometimes I just stay silent. I'm like, you know, stay here for a couple of breaths and leave it and kind of watch the room. I think because I've done it so much now that I understand what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And if I see somebody fidgeting, it's not about me. I think sometimes when we see somebody's reaction, especially when you're presenting, we take it personally. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people I know will be listening to this, so they might not be able to see this, but I always like to tell the story that I come from a leadership and more co corporate communication training background where I would lead workshops with teams around the world, but these workshops would be like seven, eight hours long. And there's always one person in those seven hour workshops who is staring at me for what feels <laughs> like six out of the seven hours <laughs> like this. <laughs> and for those of you who couldn't just see my face, they were looking at me like I was a crazy person. <laughs> And what's amazing about this experience is that it was always that person who at the end of the day would come up to me and go, thank you so much. That was the most helpful training I think I've ever experienced. And what was so interesting and dissonant, because this would happen over and over again, was that, first of all, we have no idea what we look like when we're in listening mode. Unless you've watched yourself listen to someone else, <laughs> you have no idea what you look like. So that's number one. But number two is that we think that when someone's looking at us with some sort of expression, that that says something about us and usually something negative because of our own negativity bias wired in our brain because we're constantly just trying to survive and protect ourselves. So even an expression that looks like someone's confused by what we're saying or they're not into what we're saying is registered in the limbic brain as threatening right? So no wonder we turn that into a negative story. But more often than not, that's usually someone's face just focusing. 
just taking in the information and it actually has nothing to do with you. In fact, it's probably a good sign that they're paying attention. Yes, I love that. It's our thinking phase <laughs> because so many times I've been paying attention to something and somebody just asked me like, what's wrong? And I'm like, excuse me, I'm di I don't even, I'm digesting, like nothing's wrong. And my closest friends are like, you look constipated. I'm like, well, I'm just trying to like digest it all. This is fascinating. I'm truly enjoying it. But my friends are like, you do not look like you're enjoying it. Yes, that is so funny. And yeah, that's it. That's it. It just, it has nothing to do with us. And if anything, it is actually, and I can say this from a lot of experience with it, it's usually a good sign, more so than a bad sign. I mean, of course, use your judgment. Sometimes if someone's looking at you, and in those cases, sometimes this would happen where someone looked like they were confused or like what I was saying was just in another language that they did not speak. And so I would check in with them and I would say something like, hey, I just wanted to check in. Are you tracking what I'm saying? Just want to make sure that everything's landing just to get mm. some feedback and not in a particularly needy or apologetic way at all. Just a purely direct, I'm here to help. I'm here to make sure that you're getting what you need. So let me just get some feedback real quick. Is this landing? Cool. I'll keep going. Right. And so then I no longer have to question for the rest of the day or the conversation whether or not they're looking at me crazy because I'm crazy <laughs> or they're looking at me crazy because that's just how they're thinking. That's right. Their thinking. And you get to drive the room in a way to get the information you need from what you're sharing right now. Yeah. 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 There's this concept that I love that I've been using a lot in my courses and my live group coaching program, which is this idea of gentle authority. Priya Parker, I, I hope I'm getting her name right. Priya Parker wrote this book that's beautiful called The Art of Gathering. And she really talks about how important the rules of engagement are in any conversation or group setting or even family gathering, like even a wedding, that it's those situations where we're really clear what the rules are that make us feel more comfortable and they feel more meaningful. And I bring that up because just that example of me checking in with people to make sure they're tracking, that's me using a gentle authority, letting people know that in this setting that we're in, I'm taking care of whether or not they're tracking the information. I'm not just here to throw information at them, but to actually make sure that they're receiving it. And there's so many other examples of how we can use gentle authority, but I think a lot of people back away from doing things like that, like checking in, because they're afraid that it, what, what do you think? Why do you think people? I think they're afraid to interrupt either the flow or afraid to hear the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But if we play that out, hearing the answer will give them all the information that they need to be effective, right. to actually have the impact that they want to have, to actually connect with the people they're speaking to, to actually make sure that the information is translating. And, so yeah. and, in, term, and in turn, it can help you calm your physiology instead of wondering what yeah. the hell is happening too. So in a way, you're also... Is that self-soothing or just helping yourself calm down a little bit? I think it's a fine line. And I think that's a really smart question, right? I think it's all about what's the intention mm. in doing so. If the intention is to self-soothe, that it's really about you and you just getting someone to make you feel good about how you're doing, you might want to watch out for that because that's just, that's just people pleasing in disguise. Right. right. But if it's really about making sure that they're getting the information, they're tracking, they're on the same page, everything's clear to them, then it's for them. It's also for you, but it's mostly for them, for them. which ultimately the exceptional communicator is both in alignment, right? Communicating from a place of self-trust and integrity, but also really taking care of the listener. Oh, I love how we just put that into practice. <laughs> that part of me is like, this is so meta. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think any listener who 
can relate to, you know, being nervous when we're trying to say anything. These are such useful tips and just awareness to know how our body is reacting. It's not against us because we try to usually push the nerves away, but no, they're there to protect you. And then, okay, what is the intention that I'm trying to do? And that's so powerful. Yes. And I, you know, I, we've talked in the past and I know you have your acting background and I'm so curious to know how you've integrated what you've learned into your coaching, because you've also shared that no matter how many times you've been in front of stage, you still get nervous. And I think people think that people who are confident, they don't get nervous anymore. And it's such a myth. Can you talk to oh, you know, yes. all that? <laughs> such a myth. First, I just want to name that if you don't feel nervous, like even just a little bit of nervous, a little bit of adrenaline, when eyes turn to you, when you're on the spot, there's other people watching you, you're about to speak up or just be seen in any way, then we really have two choices. Either we need to call 911 to get an ambulance to you as quickly as possible because there is something neurobiologically not well connected there. Or we call 911 because we need to lock you away because you might be some sort of sociopath. I, mean, I was going to say that. I'm like, can we say that? <laughs> there are really only few choices. And anyone who tells you otherwise, I will say this confidently because I've been studying it for almost a decade. Anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something that doesn't work. They're trying to make you think that there is some sort of magic pill that you can swallow to make nervousness go away forever. And what that pill would be if it existed would kill you because you need nerves to keep you alive. That's why they're structurally part of your system. At the same time, as someone who does do communication coaching and feels really passionately about it, I will never tell you that your nerves will go away completely. But what I can tell you is that you can learn to dance with them. You can learn to recognize when they're flooding your system and you can learn really practical skills for bringing down those hormone levels, specifically adrenaline and cortisol, which are the ones that make us feel really nervous, heart racing, face turning red, shakiness, lots of chatter going on to, to bring down those levels. There are skills that we can learn to do that and skills to really shorten the warm up period so that the flooding of our system doesn't last as long and derail us. Okay, so nerves will never go away for, forever. And just to talk to your question about my acting experience, yeah, you know, it's funny because from a really young age, performing and having that rush but also learning to be in the flow and have that presence with people on stage was what made me feel alive and what made me feel seen. So from a young age, well, for some people, it's a really negative experience. For me, at a young age, it was a really positive experience. Just ha like figuring out how to work through the nerves and do something that I was good at. It was only later in life once like the cultural conditioning and the pressures and the definitions of success and all the other things were really thrown at me and started swirling around me that nerves became a thing that I didn't really know how to dance with anymore and would abandon myself in the moment of experiencing them to try and act like someone I wasn't. And I think so many people who are listening can relate to that, right? When we're little and we feel nerves, it feels the purest form of nerves, which can feel like a thrill in a lot of cases, but it's only later, once the pressures and social condition kicks in, that nerves, we start to make them mean something about us. That's just not true. Mm, that just gave me so much chills. It's us interpreting them and attaching the weight of our worth with the nerves. Yes. As opposed to what if we remembered that nerves are what remind us that we are alive and that we're healthy and that our brain is working 
and that we're connected to every other human being on the planet because every other human being experiences this, if not on a daily basis, regularly. Right. And when we start to really own that and make peace with that and heal that, and we learn the practical skills to deal with it so that we can step into the vision that we actually have for ourselves and communicate the way we want to communicate, express ourselves more fully, more authentically, more powerfully, then the nerves being something that would be totally scary and derailing feels like a distant memory. I mean, even me, I still am leading trainings or what I would consider high stakes presentations all the time. I do this for a living. And one of the first things I'll tell groups is I'm experiencing it right now, right now I'm experiencing those nerves. Yeah. And it's also what is allowing me to communicate this message to you right now. Yeah. So I think we can really learn to change our relationship to it. Yeah. And I think sometimes our nerves also, it's like a mix of excitement because you're excited to be doing something like this. And yes, there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves, but if we focus, reframe it and make it, this is what I get to do and lean on the exciting part. That's the adrenaline kick that will allow you to, you know, show up and do whatever you have to do. Yes. Yes. I heard a, I don't know where it came from, but I've heard someone say, or I've read somewhere that nerves are just excitement without the breath. Whoa. <laughs> that's I feel like that's so, that's so up your alley, given your yoga, yoga and just physical well-being, right? The breath are what keeps us alive, nerves, what keep us alive. When we get those two things working together, then we're yeah. in touch. We're in touch with being alive. We're not scared of being alive scared of being alive I really love that because when we're nervous or even when we're stressed out we breathe less our breath is shortened and you might get palpitations and all of that and it's so powerful how a deep breath can completely just bring you back to your body instead of spiraling in your mind yes yes absolutely what are some tips you have from back in your performing days to prepare yourself before you go perform yeah, so definitely working on the physiology piece first, right? So some of the skills that I teach inside the Confident Communicator, one of my courses or Presence Under Pressure, my group coaching program, is to first really get in touch with where your attention is. So when we're completely present, comfortable in a totally relaxed situation, typically our attention is just on the person that we're with, right? If we're with someone else or the environment that we're in. And usually in communication, when we're totally present, grounded, our attention really manifests in our eyes, like where our eyes are. So right now, as I'm talking to you on Zoom, my eyes are completely with you. If I were to start to give in to some of the adrenaline and cortisol impulses, my eyes would start doing this, which if you can't see me right now, they're darting all around the room. And what this darting is doing is it's my limbic brain trying to find my nearest exit. Oh. I'm trying to get out of this situation. It's also me disconnecting from you, right? So if I don't have to connect with you, then I'm not as exposed, I'm not as vulnerable, I'm not as here. If my eyes can dart around the room to find my thoughts, which is what I think that I'm doing, I'm looking for my thoughts. I'm also in a lot of ways escaping the connection piece. So it's really a self-protective mechanism. If I go away to find my thoughts and I can disconnect from you, then I'm not as present. You tracking that? Yeah, yeah.
that. Yeah. What if someone's, what if I'm talking to someone high stakes here and I'm super nervous and I don't want to make intense eye contact? How can you find the balance between not darting away and not just glaring at that person? Yes, such a great question. The goal is 80 20, is what I always say. The goal is 80% of the time I am focused with you and on you, letting my thoughts just pour out of me straight through my eyes, straight through my energy, through my body, directly to you. 20% of the time I need to go somewhere else to just collect my thoughts in one place and then anchor my focus back to you. Fantastic. You're a human being. That's the idea. Mm-hmm. The reason that I say, 80, 20, that the majority of the time you want to be with that person too, is not only are you going to get to send all those quality, send all those signals you want to be sending, right? Of trustworthiness, directness, intelligence, where our eyes are is a really important signal in terms of how people perceive us, but also because of our thought processing. When we let our eyes move more, it's, we make it harder on our brain to actually retrieve the information we're looking for. You want to think of your thought processing like a teleprompter. There's a teleprompter scrolling in your brain with your next thought. The more still you keep your eyes, the more steady you keep your eyes, the easier it is to retrieve the next thought. But the more we let our eyes dart, there's no one at the CBS station in your brain. (laughs) Press and pause when you go dart off somewhere. So it'll keep going. And that's where people get more scattered. They start rambling more because their behavior is scattered. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the communication skills that I teach are really behavioral. How can you get your behavior to serve both your message, the way you wanna come across, and also your own internal processing? And then the last thing I'll say about eye contact too is that it's not inherently awkward to make eye contact. It's inherently awkward to be aware of the fact that you're making eye contact, right? So right now you and I are like, whoa, I, I, <laughs> yeah. can I take a break and go somewhere else? Yes, you can. So the idea is that when you're just aware of it, you're aware of making eye contact and it's uncomfortable, you really wanna focus back out on the person that you're speaking to. Because if you're aware of the eye contact, then you've gotten in your head. Mm. You've gotten, you, you went back, you went back into your head. So an image I love to use is you wanna think of there being a spotlight inside of your brain at all time. And that spotlight is either shining out, focusing on the person that you're speaking to, or it's turned around, focused back on you, blinding you to whatever might be going on for you in that situation. So you really want to lightly just focus back out. And some ways you can do that is just objectively in your own mind, just start to notice some things about that person, not judging things about that person, just noticing. So like for you, with you right now, I might just say in my own brain, she's, she has black hair, she's wearing a pink sweater, <laughs> she has gold earrings. It sounds silly and simple, but it'll do something really important, which is it'll get your focus off of you and back onto the other person. Right. And it pulls you out of your head, which is always what the spiral, like I, at the beginning, I was so excited to talk to you and I'm like, and then I became so self-aware of how I was talking, how I'm moving, that I got in my head. I'm like, why? I know, friend. Why am I so nervous? She's not judging me. And then I had to just like, okay, I have to do it again. That's so fascinating. And that's part of the work. And that's also why I always make it fun. Like, if we don't also have a sense of humor about this stuff, then what are we doing, right? Because it's just so silly and absurd to be alive and to evaluate how we communicate in the world. But we do have to go through that learning curve, which is we have to start in that unconsciously incompetent place, right? We don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. Then we start to learn about new school, new skills, new tools, new ideas, and we become consciously incompetent, right? Now we know that we're not particularly awesome at that skill we're learning yet, But then with enough discomfort, repetitive discomfort of just noticing that we don't know how to do it yet, we become consciously competent. So when we're thinking about that skill, when I'm thinking about just trying to hold eye contact with you, keep my focus out, really just try to connect with you, I can be consciously competent. When I'm thinking about it, I can do it. And then ultimately the goal is that I become more and more unconsciously competent. 
I don't have to think about it. Just making eye contact with you and connecting with you is an ingrained habit. So that it slowly becomes a skill. And I can imagine that these things might be so overwhelming when you first learn about it. You're nervous to speak out loud and then you're learning about your body. So you're trying to control your body. And then you also want to practice what you're saying. But I love how you put it as in like you are consciously aware of it. You said Mm -hmm. it in a better way (laughs) until it becomes habit. That's it. And that's also why especially in my course, The Confident Communicator, I'm, I really made sure to break it down step by step. I cannot possibly throw all of these things at you at once. Have you focusing on your physiology, physicality, intentionality, individuality, messaging all at once and go, here you go, figure it out. No way. We got to start piece by piece, first figuring out and learning, understanding what's going on inside. Okay. What can I do to really manage that practically? Not in some sort of woo-woo, live your best life, this is going on, but just, you know, fear is excitement, so you'll be fine. No, it's very, very practical. Then we can move on to gaining some self-awareness. What is your communication style authentically? And what is, and also just right now, habitually, what shows up for you in communication situations that you can really assess your own style, track your own patterns figure out what is true to you and what's just self-protective that might be keeping you from playing bigger. Maybe you take up less space than you think you take up when you communicate. Maybe you use a lot of us and ums. Maybe you start, maybe you speak in a lot of misplaced upward inflections where your voice keeps going up into question marks like mine's doing right now, which might make you sound less like you know what you're talking about. We have to look at that stuff. We just have to pull it apart in a really systematic way to see what's there. And then from there, you get to get really clear on, okay, what's the vision though that I hold for myself? And what signals one at a time can I start experimenting with so that I'm communicating in a way that's way more aligned with that vision? From there, we can dig into the mindset piece of things. Okay, Once I have my signals working for me and I know how to nurture myself from the inside, then what intention am I bringing to my interactions? Where do I need to get my mind? And then finally, we can move on to the messaging piece of things, how to be more articulate, how to be more succinct, how to trust your instinct, how to frame your message, how to be more convincing without trying to convince or prove, you know, all these things, but really I'm walk people through it in building blocks so that it's not overwhelming. It's manageable and it's fun. It's really also fun. Yes. Fun. Like that's the energy I get from you because it's, it's such a, I feel like vulnerable thing or subject to work on. Like anybody who know, I don't feel like eloquent. I want to talk better. It's so scary to dive into the what, but I think having this really, really great um, clear framework and the way you hold space and like, yeah, you don't have to be serious about this. You've got this. Um, I'm really curious about authentically, how does one find their voice when we've been so conditioned to speak a certain way in quotations, how do you dial into that? Yeah. Oh, I love this question. I feel like two things. One, as much as there are things to learn, there's a lot to unlearn. Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to really finding your voice and tapping into what feels like your authentic expression, it's really parsing out what are the self-protective behaviors I've learned and adopted as habits over the years in order to fill in the blank, right? Come across a certain way, protect myself, keep people at a distance that I didn't want coming close, whatever that is for you. It's unlearning or again, really parsing out what did you learn because you felt like you needed to, to survive in a way or to get to the next level versus what are the things that were, that are just innately built into you as part of your just genius design 
a good example of this is when I talk to people, which is always so fun and funny about hand gestures, right? Because there's all these myths out there about use your hands, don't use your hands, you can use your hands too much. And what I always go back to is people, we learned how to use our hands to communicate way before we learned how to speak with our words. No matter what culture in the world you are in, and whatever, no matter what the cultural norms are, as babies, we reach for things, we point to things, we use our hands. And so to me, there's no debate. Hand gestures are a natural, pure, essential piece of everyone's communication style. And yes, there's such thing as using your hands with a lot of tension and letting them fly in front of your face and just relying on them so heavily that they become distracting and distract from your message. Sure, I'll give you really practical tools for just how to rein that in and let them communicate in the way that they naturally wanna communicate. But that's just such a good example of we have to unlearn that message that you got maybe about don't use your hands because you're too much, right? For some people that's true versus remembering, wait, hold up. I knew how to communicate with my hands. I was communicating with my hands without even thinking about it. It's just a natural extension of my own expression. So of course it's true. So that's one example. That's one piece of it, unlearning in addition to the learning. And I think the other piece is really tapping into what's the vision that you hold for yourself. When you close your eyes, when you take that deep breath, and you think about that way that you wanna put yourself out there in the best possible circumstance, right? So let's say it's a speech or a TED talk or a webinar or an Instagram video or a tricky conversation. And you imagine yourself in that situation. I want you to imagine the best possible, truest expression of you in that moment. How do you feel? How are you communicating? What is the other person seeing in you? We're all able to use our imagination to tap into that vision. And then we use that vision next to our values, our driving values, the things that we know to be true about ourselves right now, the things that matter to us more than anything else, the things that drive our decision-making. We hold that vision and those values next to each other. And we really use that as a blueprint for building the skills to get there and to experience that. And I will never say it's like a destination. And then you arrive and then you can sit on the beach and drink margaritas. No, no. I teach this stuff for a living and I am constantly checking in with, am I walking the talk? Am I integrating both my values and the vision that I hold for myself? But even just asking yourself that question is really what can allow you to tap into, into your voice, into what's the truest expression for you. That, these are such powerful tips. Thank you so much for sharing there. I'm like digesting it. It's, I think so often we get so focused on the message, what we want to say, what we want, that we forget about ourselves. What is important for me? What is my value? And I think that's such a strong anchoring point to just hear your voice, whatever it is. You might not be you know, super eloquent or speak like X person, but your voice is your voice. Yes. And we don't have any other voice like it. We need your voice exactly as it is. And you know what's so funny? I think we might've mentioned this or we might've touched on this earlier, but most people come to me because they think it's just the messaging thing they got to work out, like how to string all the words together in the most eloquent, concise, compelling way. And I definitely provide tools and frameworks to do that. But that's really just the gravy, meaning that becomes so much more obvious how to do that once you're clear on the vision that you hold for yourself and the unique value that you bring to a situation. The words just tumble out. They want to. They want to just tumble out and serve your intention. So it's just really getting clear on what that intention is. And the rest is, like I said, gravy. Mm, 
I love this because I really wanted to talk about executive presence. And I think this is such a good way to talk about your authentic voice and what is executive presence. And back in my agency days, executive presence, the way I defined it was someone who's confident, loud, and assertive. And whoever embodied those traits were likely to be promoted or be quote unquote successful. And I was like, this is not me. I'm never going to speak like that person. So I thought maybe I'm not meant for this. So what is executive presence? And please help us debunk it. <laughs> yes, any time, any day of the week. Yes. So first thing I can say about executive presence, the, the way that it's used, especially in corporate settings, is as essentially a North Star for how emerging leaders and leaders need to represent themselves or really present themselves in order to be taken seriously and admired by the people that they're working with or that they're leading, right? So executive presence is usually about gravitas, like how much someone is able to have command of the room just is able to establish immediate respect and trust. The problem with this concept, if I may, and really one of the major reasons I started Self-Spoken is because just this concept of executive presence, which also comes with the implication that you are just this polished, perfect communicator too, is that it was created in order to keep people who didn't look like old antiquated images of power out of power. Because executive presence, the whole idea is built on the idea that people can learn to communicate like those people that you identified who are so not you. And so having them as a model or a symbol of if you wanna get to the top, you have to communicate like this is a very efficient way to keep people playing small. Because if you don't automatically relate to that or think that you can do that, then you stay in line. So we could go really deep on how this is part of the patriarchy, but executive presence, it's not all bad in that I think there is something really beautiful that could emerge from this concept, which I like to think about, which is just authentic leadership presence, which is this ability to show up with a sense of personal power, right? A sense of personal trust, really owning that you know what you're talking about, but without attaching it to an old image of power, an antiquated idea or a box that people have to fit into. We have a lot of work to do as a society and as a culture to make sure that our images and our symbols and our, our, our heroes and role models for leadership are people who model the possibility of every single person in our world. I believe that everyone is a leader. Everyone is a leader in their own right. In fact, I tell this story that I always held in my heart is really painful, which is funny, but now I, I'm able, to, I think since evolving a bit, I find just really funny, I guess, which is that when I was about five years old, I have this memory of sitting by a pool with my dad. And my dad is a very specific personality. He's grew up in the Bronx. He's tells it like it is. He's a bit of a jokester. And he's also, challenged me a lot in my life in not always the most positive ways but challenged me and I remember I was sitting on that on a lounge chair looking down at my little chubby legs just drying off and he was reading a newspaper and he turned to me and he goes hey Bren would you say you're a leader or a follower and I said and I kind of turned my head away and I really thought about it for a second and I said, I think that I'm a leader, but nobody's following me. And then he laughed. And I remember the laugh being really painful, but I also now as an adult 
thinking about a five-year-old child saying that is just first like kind of hilarious, but also super precious that in a way as kids, we have this sense that we are a leader and we're not really bothered about whether or not anyone's following us, right? It's less about that. And of course, leadership is important to me and making sure that you're creating a community if that's what you wanna do in the world or influencing culture or whatever it means to you to be a leader in connection to other people. That's super important. But I think we lose touch with this idea that just by standing in our own integrity, separate from whether people are following us, we are a leader. And what if just doing that was the new version of presence that we all aspire to, right? As opposed to just executive presence, which is just really code for this old white male, polished, stiff idea of presence that really leaves out our stories, our humanity, the different faces and cultures that can inhabit that sort of presence. So that's really what executive presence is and a little bit about what I think <laughs> ought to change about it. Yeah, oh, I wanna hug that little five-year-old brand. That was such a moving story. It's so powerful to just stand in your integrity and that uh, trust, that unwavering trust and belief in yourself, no matter what anyone around you is saying or the latest trend in TikTok, whatever the dances are, you know, doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, you're you, you know what you're capable of. Yeah, yeah. And listen, I also say it with a, an awareness of my own privilege too, right? That I think for a lot of people, getting to that place of self-trust is really tricky because of the conditions, the culture, the situations that they've grown up in. And at the same time, I just deeply believe that each of us has one wild and precious life. And if we're gonna spend it trying to hustle for the approval of other people or to fit into boxes that were not meant to contain us, then we're just slowly dying. Ultimately, we're not living. And so the reason I'm so passionate about communication skills specifically and really finding your voice in this way is because those moments when you're on the spot, those are just the slices of being alive. They're the slices of being so in touch with what it feels like to be alive and to put yourself out there. And if we can feel good and show up fully in those moments, I mean, sky's the limit, not to mention what a better, more connected world we'd live in if we could all embrace those moments instead of running away from them or abandoning ourselves or just depleting our own resources to get through them. So touching. I'm going to frame everything you've said. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about the course that you have coming up. Yeah, sure. So the Confident Communicator is a holistic step-by-step -step program to really help you dial down nerves in the moment, just like we've talked about, to really exude the qualities that you want coming across, whether that's confidence, credibility, more authority, trustworthiness, whatever is important to you. We really dive into how to signal that and how to gain self-awareness around your own patterns and habits so that you can ditch the ones that aren't serving you and really build the ones that are. We also dive into the mindset piece of things so that you can show up to these situations with a much more empowered sense of what you bring to the table, of what intention you really have so that you can ultimately articulate whatever you wanna say so much more clearly, fluidly, in a compelling way. So it's really all the pieces of foundational holistic communication skills and you can take the course in a few ways. You can either binge it in a few days if you're that kind of person, kind of like reading a great personal or professional development book just to ingest all the insights and fill yourself up with a bunch of really practical information. 
or you can take it over the course of four to eight to however many weeks it takes you to really work through the videos, follow through on all the exercises, apply them in your day-to-day -day interactions and integrate the skills. Or you can really take it a la carte, meaning you can pop in there when you know you have this tricky conversation coming up and you wanna get clear on what intention you're bringing and what are some of the talking points that you wanna hit. Or let's say you're preparing for interviews and you wanna make sure you really know how to dial down those nerves and exude the qualities you want coming across. You can hit it up in that way. So you can really use it in whatever way is most useful and supportive. And also this summer, in addition to getting lifetime access to this course, we'll also be doing live coaching calls with me, which will be a chance for us to dig deeper into your specific questions, concerns, struggles, or we could even role play a specific situation in your life so I can coach you through it. So that's the Confident Communicator. It's opening for enrollment on Tuesday, June 8th. If you join the wait list, depending on when you're listening to this, or you sign up for the masterclass that's happening on June 8th, you'll get all the good details. And if you feel moved to work on any of this stuff, if any of what you heard today resonates with you, I'd love to meet you this summer. And I can personally say that Bren is magic. We were just chatting about life and she helped me find so much clarity with like one sentence about something I was working on. And that was just like a couple of minutes. I'm like, Bren, I, yeah, she, she's good. She's going to pull your authenticity out of you. <laughs> <laughs> You're so great. Love you. <laughs> I'm so grateful for you. I don't want this to end, but <laughs> I want to be respectful of your time. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Ooh, I love them. And I also don't want this to end, but yes. I'm ready. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Probably that I make people feel seen and not alone. A book that's changed your life. Untamed by Glennon Doyle. I still need to read that. It's a, I have so many to read books right now, but it's moving up the list. Oh, that that's it. I I lovingly refer to it as truly the Bible. I think it's it's a biblical book, especially if you are a woman or identify as a woman living in our world who wants to stop pleasing everyone so that you can live in your truth this is the book for you. And then the Confident Communicator would also be a helpful course to take, but, but I came is, is the truly a biblical book. What does coming home mean to you? Ooh, so good. It means unlearning. It means forgiving. Mm -hmm. And it means really deeply trusting myself. I felt that. Mm -hmm. What would you like more of? Spaciousness. <laughs> Spaciousness. I'm so jazzed about what I'm getting to do and work on in the world right now. And I also need more time in between the things. So I definitely am working on creating some more spaciousness. Advice for younger self. Oh. <laughs> it's all gonna be okay. I think is what I really would tell my younger self. It's all gonna be okay, yeah. Where can people find you? You can find me over at selfspoken.com. You can find me on Instagram at Bren underscore selfspoken. And you can find me inside our amazing courses and community of just the biggest hearted go-getting people 
just from all over the world who just really know that that they can play bigger and that they can support each other and that we can support each other in playing bigger and not just for the sake of bigger but truer mm-hmm. so yeah that's where you can find me amazing brand do you have any final words for our listeners who i'm sure have enjoyed everything you've shared today my final words would first be thank you for having me. You are such a special light and such a grounding energy. Even just being around you, it's like sipping a warm herbal tea next to a candle. You're just such a soothing, beautiful presence. So thank you for doing what you're doing and for having me, letting me be a part of this beautiful platform that you've created. And I think my final words would be, I guess I'll use Maya Angelou's words, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is people might not remember what you said and people might not remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you make them feel. So if nothing else, when it comes to communicating, expressing yourself, putting yourself out there. Just focus on how you want to make people feel. You've just made me feel full of inspiration. (laughs) Thank you so much, friend. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.